It's March Mania at Sports Interaction. Wow. NHL, NBA, March Madness, MLB, so much more. It's Bananas. B-A-N-A-N-A-S. That was good spelling. Thank you. Play Pinata Picks and Minute Madness exclusive games with insane odds. You can't play anywhere else. Make your next bet at Sports Interaction. Download the app in Ontario. Use the QR code at the bottom of the screen. Or head to sportsinteraction.com slash STPN to get started. It's 19 plus. Please play responsibly. Welcome to Nailing the Apex. I'm Tim Haraney. Head on over to Spotify. Give the show a five-star rating. Uh, same goes for Apple Podcasts. Write a review. It helps us grow the pod a lot, and we'd really appreciate it as well. You can follow me on social media, at Tim Haraney. Uh, today, we have a very special guest with us. He's worked all across the motorsports landscape, working with some of the biggest names in the sport, from the likes of Mark Webber, Sebastian Vettel, Daniel Ricciardo, to IndyCar's Joseph Newgarden, and now running the Aero McLaren IndyCar team. It's Canadian Gavin Ward. Gavin, uh, thank you for taking the time uh to do this i like your hat thanks thanks yeah no happy to be here (laughs) well dude you gotta tell everybody about your hat man that's like vintage oh yeah this is a 1990 indy 500 hat we're running today i like to bring out a bit of vintage 500 memorabilia (laughs) Um, (laughs) got a bit of reputation around here showing up with some hats so uh (laughs) uh okay so gavin i mean you've uh like i said off the top you know you've worked all across the motorsport uh landscape i mean where uh did your passion for racing come from i mean because you know you started at a really young age i mean i think you and i worked together i don't know it was around formula ford back in like 2000 or 2001 i believe we were yeah. i think we were both in high school at the time yeah. i was racing and you were like engineering so i had a pretty pretty young age man so where did it all sort of come from yeah i mean so i grew up in toronto uh in the beaches um and you know i just my grandparents owned a farm property that was pretty much next door to um what was then mossport now canadian tire motorsport park um, and we used to spend a lot of time up there, uh, holidays, weekends, summers, you name it. And, um, you know, I think that's where it all started for me. My, my dad used to take us over, we'd sneak in and go watch race cars over there. And you kind of always could, you could hear if, if cars were running. Um, and, you know, I think, and it's kind of funny cause I got actually, that was kind of where the motorsport thing started, mm-hmm. but really at first when I was probably about 10 years old, I think I, I wanted to design like sports cars and I was just a car geek and I read everything I could about cars. And then, um, you know, by about 13, I think I was like, had moved into racing being the thing I wanted to do and dabbled a little bit of wanting to, uh, to be a race car driver, did a little bit of karting, ran out of money doing that. And then, yeah, started volunteering with, uh, formula Ford. That's where we met from this F1600, uh, stuff in high school. And, yeah, went from there. And then you went all the way over to Europe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oxford Brooks University in England, like just out of nowhere. And so, I mean, for, first of all, that's a huge move. Uh, I mean, second of all, did, this came, I guess I'm assuming as soon as you graduated high school, you then moved to, to, to Europe, moved to England? Or did you, or was there, was there something else? Because, like, I remember you were telling me about. Um, their engineering schools over there are pretty phenomenal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, uh, you know, when I was in high school, it's kind of funny. I was pretty bored in school, to be honest, because all I wanted <laughs> to do was race car stuff. And I was like, man, this stuff is... I mean, I, I remember showing up to... I mean, I was a bit of a daydreamer, so I remember showing up to this class. Uh, it was like finite math class, and I didn't realize I had a test that day. I hadn't, hadn't studied for it. got like halfway through this test, and like, I, I'm... I'm lost and I don't really know what I'm doing. So I just flipped the flipped the thing over. I was drawing race cars on the back of it, like it's just total. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the, you know, I was just trying to figure out any way to get a job in racing was kind of my thing. I remember talking to, I'd go hang around the paddock at Mossport or down at the the Indy car race in Toronto and just ask people like, how'd you get into racing? How'd you get a job in this? I want to do it. And, uh, you know, at one point I thought I was going to get like a CDL and be, be a, you know, be a truck driver, let me my way into the sport. And then, you know, I found on, it was the Arrows Formula One website, uh, way back in the day. Um, they had a thing. If you want to be an engineer in Formula One, mm-hmm. like go to Oxford Brooks. And they had a sort of link up with them, this university in Oxford. Um, and then that's how I kind of got looking into this program. And then, yeah, I applied I applied to them, 
in a bunch of Canadian schools as I was graduating. Um, and I, I turned it up academically by then because I kind of had a, some <laughs> name for. So <laughs> uh, managed to get some half decent grades and then got accepted over there. Yeah, my mom was very confused very confused about the school in England you want to go to like work on race cars like what <laughs> but you know at the end of the day very supportive so yeah I uh made the leap over across the pond when I was 18 moved over there it was an undergraduate degree and it had an option um after you've done a couple of years to take a year out in industry um and I applied to a bunch of places I applied to every f1 team I've gotten rejection letters from most of them still. <laughs> oh, you kept the letters? Yeah, I kept the letters. <laughs> um, at the time, you know, I was just, I was such a geek on like motor racing that I was like, oh man, look, Ferrari let, wrote me a letter or whatever. <laughs> like it's got Ferrari letterhead or it's got McLaren letterhead. I think I got McLaren one somewhere, but <laughs> you know, I just got a kick out of that. Like, even though it was like, we're not giving you a job, but whatever. <laughs> And then I, I actually landed, so I had an offer of an internship with uh, a champ car team. Um, nice. And they were a st just starting up Canadian champ car team back in the day. And oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I thought I was going to move home for a year and do that. And then they ran out of money. So yeah. <laughs> that was like a bad I remember that. <laughs> And I was getting towards the end, but I was still going to do it because they were still running some form that same team was running Formula BMW cars, mm -hmm. and I was still going to do it because I had nothing else kind of lined up. And um, I was studying for my la like final exams at the end of the year, and uh, I remember because I'd been like studying like hard. I went actually went home and like took a nap because I'd like not slept, and <laughs> and uh, I got woken up by phone ringing, and it was Red Bull saying, "Hey, like we want you to come for an interview for this." internship like i thought i applied to jag and then the team got bought by red bull mm -hmm. i thought it all just like wasn't gonna happen so i i kind of ridden that one off and i had a flight home to toronto book to think my exam was like on the friday and i was flying back on like the following tuesday or something like that so i was like can you make it monday <laughs> like that's the only day we can do They're like yeah we can do monday I'm like all right cool so i went up there i did this interview and uh, it seemed to go pretty well, but I wasn't too sure. And then they were kind of asking me my deal. And I said, well, actually, I, you know, I'm flying home tomorrow to start this other internship. And it's like, well, if you can hold them off for like a couple of days, we'll let you know. So I flew back to Canada. And the next day, phone rang. And it's like, you got the job. I was like, all right, I guess I'll turn around and come back. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, where did you like, so, wait, so you get into Red Bull. I mean, where did you, where did they first have you working? I mean, because obviously they were quite, starting to get i mean they were quite new on the grid but like where exactly within the organization that they have you working because it wasn't was a track side right away or they have you do, doing more factory stuff first yeah so i started as a R and d development group uh, uh placement student as they called it over there and that was basically just special development projects uh i worked on a sort of a break one of the first projects i did was like on this break Rig, where we're looking at different ways of bleeding brakes and just better ways mm. of building brake systems. And I quickly kind of got stuck. The guy that was my boss, well, this is the state of Red Bull. This was like the first year of Red Bull. So it was a pretty tumultuous time over mm. there. The place has changed a lot. But uh, there was a lot of turnover. And my boss left pretty quickly. But his boss became my boss, who was also in charge of all the electronic control systems on the car. And back in those days, that's traction control, engine brake, act active engine braking control. We were developing the first instant shift gearboxes. Um, we have full active launch control, you know. Uh, so there's a lot of lot of toys in that world. And I quickly kind of moved into MATLAB based. For those who don't know, MATLAB's kind of like a engineering software for data geekery, but kind of, um, analysis projects on the control side, looking at fuel consumption, up, you know, gear shift quality, stuff like that. Um, and then about six months into my internship, my boss, we had some turnover on the control system side. One guy moved to be a race uh, performance engineer. Another guy retired. We had a full-time full test team back then. So this was the old days of F1 where you had mm -hmm. like a full crew that just went testing to run the cars and you had the race team. And... Uh, my boss is like, do you want to come be test team control system engineer for the rest of your placement? I was like, heck yeah. Yeah, great. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so 
So that was around January. We were just launching the the what was the RB two um, new car, um, which was interesting in and of itself. I remember we mm-hmm. went the first test of that car was at Silverstone. It was in January, and it was like lightly snowing. <laughs> And we were like overheating after a couple laps. <laughs> it was like, oh god, something seriously wrong. But anyways, the... <laughs> never mind. <laughs> so I did this job, and I got thrown into it, and I was sort of like, okay, I was testing control system engineer, and then it was the first race of the year. It was down in Australia, and my boss called me from Australia, and he's like, basically one of the race team guys had quit, um, and he's like, do you want to come racing from Imola, which is the first European race? of the season I'm like hell yeah let's go no idea what I'm doing but whatever <laughs> so next thing you know I was doing all races all tests uh, you know as an intern getting paid peanuts I think I was making more money in cash cash expenses than I was in uh, than the salary but whatever you know it was uh, you definitely were like racetrack to racetrack barely saw home but it was a whirlwind for sure what's uh, so where did they what, what was it like I guess your first time because you got to go on the grid right because you, you would have to be sifting through some of the control electronic systems and gearbox stuff too um before the start of the race obviously what what was that like like your first time like experiencing like stepping foot onto a formula one grid like what was that like for you i mean it was goosebumps for sure like i remember walking in just walking into the paddock at emila um when i was like taking photos on my phone and like total (laughs) fanboy about it all but like but at the same time, absolutely shit scared. Like, absolutely yeah, sure. terrified that I was going <laughs> to screw something up. And I was working as David Coulthard's control system engineer. And, uh, you know, I remember my boss, uh, who was great to me, but he was, he was kind of, he's quite a character. And I remember, um, I think before the start of the race, he said something. And I'm sure it was joking, but at the same time, I was pretty nervous, so I wasn't trying to take it. And it was something along the lines of, if you if you screw up, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> it's like, oh, God. <laughs> and uh, we had an all right start, which was part of the one of the big responsibilities. But then, um, actually, my first race, we had a control system. It was not really my fault, but the control system misbehaved. There's a sensor that went awry in a pit stop, and it ended up, like, tricking out the launch control so that it switched itself off and then basically as a result of that um it broke the drive shafts on cool threads car launching from the box because this like software thing got haywire so that was my first race as a control system engineer with a control system related dnf but it was like oh god (laughs) (laughs) but you managed to eventually graduate like up there up through their system and you know, you you became one of their engineers. Like you were engineering. Who did you start engineering first? Was it Coulthard, Weber, or was it both? Like how how did that work? Yeah. So my first year, when I was still an intern, I was working just on Coulthard's car, uh, doing the control system stuff. And then basically, I went back. I finished my degree at Brooks. I had one more year to do. I did my dis- Red Bull were really great to me. They sponsored me. They they paid my fees, expenses to go back to school. I did my dissertation for them on control system work, Mm. clutch preparation, stuff to do with uh, kind of race starts. And then I, when I graduated, I came back on the race, just onto the race team, not race and test anymore. We had some Mm. more engineers, but (laughs) uh, then I was Mark Weber's control system engineer uh, from 2007. Um, Yeah, and then I did that for a while, so. 2008, they brought the standard ECU uh, in, so that changed the control system world a lot over there, clamped down on trash control and all those things. But then I was control system engineer for both cars, and so I, I worked with um, Weber, and then, well, from 2009, I think it was, Weber and Vettel was, was control system engineer on both cars, did that 9 and 10. 2010, we won the championship with Vettel. Um, And then I moved into performance engineering, so race engineer, performance engineer um, role back on Weber's car. And I did that for 11, 12, 13. Uh, So through those double championship years, um, working with Weber, and then 2014 with the 
Danny Rick, and then I actually came off the road, still with Red Bull, and moved into the aero department and worked worked in aero doing design development, wind tunnel testing, CFD for three years, kind of doing doing that. <laughs> okay, so I want to go back to Weber. We're gonna start there. Yeah. <laughs> I have so many questions, man. <laughs> like, uh, okay, you were there for Multi Twenty One, so I don't know how much of that you can actually tell me. But hold on, he he did write about it in his book, right there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so technically it's out there. Yeah. Okay, you were his uh you were his engineer for that race, I'm assuming in Malaysia. So okay. Your feelings on that all going down because obviously if he gets the win it looks good for you too, right? Yeah, no totally. I mean, uh we thought we 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 did think we were gonna win that race with, with Mark, you know, it was an interesting one because uh we had our little code code speak to kind of shut the race down a little bit and save the motors and yeah uh you know i think the thing with that whole deal was super interesting and like i love mark weber and sebastian vettel um i mean weber is probably the there's, there's no driver i probably got a closer relationship for my years of work working with than weber so um he was a really great great guy to work with that was that was a tough day for sure i felt like um the thing that rubbed some of the team up the wrong way was the fact that sort of Weber, it's one thing to ignore team o- orders, I think, you know, if you want to call it that, or team's directive. Um, if, if, Vettel, if Vettel had just been, you know what, I'm faster, I'm going to pass him, and that was that, and it was a straight fight, it'd be hmm. kind of one thing. It'd be drivers, it's egos, it's kind of more acceptable. I think it was a shame is that, like, Weber had basically turned his motor down and then got passed, which is, uh, you know, it's not really the straight fight you want there. So mm-hmm. that was a tricky day. I kind of felt like at the time it was an opportunity for us to kind of win win people over a little bit with how we handled it. You know, it was one of those things. Is that, that was my initial reaction to it. But it was, uh, yeah, that was a frosty one for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Mark, like, and this is just from watching it, but, like, you know, Weber looked like he handled it quite well, especially in the, the cool-down room and everything, as best as I think any driver could actually handle something like that. Because it is, you know, as a competitor, I mean, that's, that's difficult to deal with. Um, you've worked with so many drivers the the relationship between you know driver and engineer and you know you're saying you had a probably one of the closer relationships is with you and mark like what what is that like like how i mean how do you have to make it work because you have you know two differing opinions sometimes but you have to also take into consideration what the driver is telling you about the car yeah you know um it is it's tricky to kind of manage a bit of that for sure. Um, the <laughs> sometimes you got to play the team hat or the driver hat a little bit, you know. And uh, that's a, that's a tricky thing in all in all forms of motor racing. I, I've actually always from a you know right now the job I do is is not driver specific and. I've done a few, like I did the control suspension engineer, engineer job that was not driver specific, but was a track side job. And, and I actually, I kind of preferred that because you didn't have to delve into that sort of the driver, driver rivalry side of things. You know, you can play the kind of team, the team thing. But when you're, you're stuck with your, your, your guy, you know, you've got to be, mm. you got to be fighting his corner as well. So it's definitely a bit of a two hats role. But, you know, what I found, and this is, Probably a bigger deal in IndyCar than it is in F1. In F1, it's much more... It's harder to manage the inter-team driver rivalry politics than it is in IndyCar, probably. Um, and in IndyCar, it's also more important to really have your drivers collaborating uh, and working well together. So um, now I, I find that's a huge emphasis of like how you, how you keep that... Mm-hmm. Keep the team working together and not being a bunch of individuals. Um, yeah, it makes but it's sense. tricky. <laughs> yeah, no, I can only imagine. I mean, like that, that's a lot of responsibility. Um, I mean, looking at the the F one drivers that you have worked with, I mean, what makes uh, and then like even looking at data, right? Like you've probably had a chance to look at Vettel's data and Weber's data, Ricard- Ricardo's data, Coulthard data. What separates like you know all of them? Because I mean, all, all of 
those drivers who I just mentioned, they're all different in different driving styles and, and things of that, na- that nature. But like, for instance, working closely with, with Weber and then also with Ricardo, what sets those two apart? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I have a it's, it's a rephrased uh, quote from a, um, a Swedish goalie coach, but he says there's as many goalie styles as there are goalies. Uh, and, uh, and I say the same. There's as many driving styles as there are drivers. And like, every driver is unique. And they come, they get, and when you're dealing with drivers at the very top, top, top end of the sport, like, like I've been lucky enough to, to deal with, um, you know, they have evolved the style they're mm. using, you know, for a reason. And um, so, Mark Weber, you know, he, when he came on the scene with us, and really when Vettel came on the scene, and then we had a proper, like, compare and contrast the styles there, Weber was the guy in high speed corners, big commitment, high speed uh, corners, and sequences of corners. So, like, real mm. S's or real trade off sequences, Weber. Weber was the guy for that style of corner, um, and he just he he hated understeer. He wanted to he drove with his hands, you know, and it was very much precision on um, having a strong front and a reactive front was was really what he craved. Um, Vettel was off in those higher those quicker stuff at first, um, but when it came to if you took like a, a boring old ninety degree uh, you know, slow speed corner or a mm-hmm. hairpin that was in isolation. Then, then Vettel was like a magician through that stuff. He was super, super good. And he, you know, his style was so different of driving. Vettel drove with his feet as much as his hands. You know, really? a lot of brake throttle overlap. Um, so that's like using throttle in the brake zone, um, carrying throttle through the apex of a corner. Very unusual style. Um, but I've heard that. Maybe Schumacher had, had some some of that in his driving style as well, yep. and then also you know he would have a way like the f- one thing that jumped out the first time I remember like Vettel jumped over and drove our the Red Bull car he was driving Toro so he came and drove the Red Bull car at a test towards the end of two thousand and eight um, at Monza, and um, you know all we got all these data metrics that are like looking at average understeer which is like a measure of stability but it's effectively driven a lot by steering angle um and you know you, you had all these metrics that were like jumping off the charts understeer and then Vettel mm-hmm. came in and it's like the car's loose like the car's like it's it's oversteering and it's like what and then you kind of learn that he had his style was so different that the way like a traditional most drivers they get the rear steps out they correct the steering mm-hmm. like they wind the steering back and like opposite lock as you might call it but Vettel had this style where if the Rear started to step out on the braking for him. He'd jam a bit of throttle and then just overcook it with lock. So he'd go way over the top of the front tire and put understeer in both by killing the front off with steering and by like basically jamming the brake bias forward by putting throttle in, um, which was like a really different way of catching a snap. For sure. But it, was, it worked really well for him. So it gave him a few uh, advantages. Um, I said, you know, he, he had his places where he wasn't as quick, and he showed that showed up in like the the 2010 season when it was really back and forth between those guys. But uh, um, when it came to like, he could run a pretty loose car and then put understeer into it mm-hmm. where it needed it, and then pull pull it out where it didn't. So it was very adaptive style. So how was he when like you know the the brake by wire system came in? I think it was 2014. Yeah. Uh, how was he with that then? Because that would kind of mess you up a bit if that's what you're used to right yeah totally and you know like yeah. that's stepping ahead that uh that was first year of uh dan ricardo mm. driving with uh with the big team um after weber retired and daniel's got a different style again um daniel's style is actually really close to joseph newgarden style but i was gonna say two drivers i work with that are the most alike those actually have a lot in common um he required quite good entry stability like to get off the brake and would like also be pretty aggressive with lock would like to turn in aggressively uh but anyways vettel yeah the brake by wire it did his head in i mean i think that was a real struggle with them because mm. then he's used to the dynamics so like 
the car binding up on the brakes and all that that sort of feel and then what you've got is this computer on board that's deciding what's the most effective way to get an end sort of torque demand again in geekery but it might trade brakes versus um the mguk as it's called so the, the electric yep. motor is doing recovery or you might trade that against the ice power and it might do that differently every lap depending on what where it's at on energy store so like but they're not the same. Mm. They're certainly not the same from feel. And they went through a bit of a, a thing there with trying to make Sebastian happy. But he had, there was more than that. I mean, honestly, the 2014, when Daniel beat uh, Seb ha- after 8 Seb had won the last four championships in a row, I think mm-hmm. the big, as much as that was an effect, the loss of exhaust effect was huge as well. Oh, that um, blown diffuser. Yeah, so you like you st- like Vettel already drove like that in 2009. There were no blown right. diffusers on these cars, and then you go right. and 2010 there wasn't really blown diffusers on the car, and he won a championship. But mm. 2011, which was the the start of the proper blown diffuser days, um, which is a whole <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was a neat time. Anyways, that was a cool time for me personally because I stepped out of control system engineering and into performance engineering at that point, and. I remember one of the first things I did in my new job. Well, I've been on it for a few weeks, and like Nui uh, flew myself, the other performance engineer, Adrian Nui, I think our head of vehicle dynamics, and Christian Horner out to Viri, where the where Renault build their motors, mm-hmm. and uh, sat us all in a boardroom there, and basically said like, "Look." Whoever does the best job of exhaust blowing next year wins the championship. So your mm-hmm. job is to find the way to make as much exhaust thrust out of this exhaust uh, this engine as, as possible. And it was like November. <laughs> so awesome. I hadn't even hit the track yet. And uh, he was he was absolutely right. But anyways, you go you step forward to Vettel has got this style of, of riding throttle on the brakes, riding throttle through the apex of the corner. Well, now, not only, you know, before that was like, okay, that's a way of driving to manipulate balance, and maybe it had some advantages and disadvantages, but now it's like 20 points of downforce, 40 wow. points of downforce difference through the corner if you can drive like that. So for him, it was like, it it just, it suited his style very, sure. very well. Yeah, for sure. It's no problem, right? That's awesome. Wow, that's, that's incredible. That in 2014. So that, I think yeah. there was like, you lost that and also the break by wire thing was a bit of a, mm. a different thing going on so so much uh for drivers like especially in formula one because like obviously every season everything's always it's always changing right the car is always changing and so the, the driving style kind of has to like adapt and, and change with it and i think if like and i think that's you know my opinion in being around the sport and covering for so long that's what separates those drivers right especially when they get to the top is just like how quick can they adapt to whatever they've been given for for that season it's yeah pretty remarkable that that's that's kind of how uh everything gets sorted out um i know i don't have too much more of your time but i want to talk about indycar and obviously coming over and and working for team penske um f- first off i mean did was it Tim Sindrick who kind of like came over and recruited you or did you apply for a position there or like how how did you make that transition from F1 to, to IndyCar? Yeah, so I'd been in Indy, uh, so I've been in F1 for 12 years. Um, so that, at that point I was working, I'd come off the road, I was doing aero design development. I'd kind of, you know, for F1's a pretty typical, everyone gets kind of siloed into their, their area of specialty and there weren't a lot of people that had moved around. The people that had general knowledge kind of had been there from the old days when it was a much smaller deal, you know, back when it was yeah. 50 people on a race team, not 800 or 1,000 or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was looking for, like, a role that could use a bit of the breadth that I'd kind of acquired from jumping around a lot at Red Bull, and, and there wasn't much there. And you know what? I got a bit – I won't lie to you. I got a little burnout out with the politics of the F1 world. I'd uh, – um, and you know, I had this kind of thing where I was like, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't want to work in any racing, and I loved IndyCar racing back then. And I used to, one of the racing engineers I worked with at Red Bull was uh, Rocky Guillaume Rockelin, he's mm-hmm. a former champ car engineer at Newman Haas, mm-hmm. Pat West, and we talk about his uh, IndyCar days. And uh, I always thought, hey, if that's you know, if, the, if IndyCar was doing, do, doing well, like someday I'd love to give that a go. So 
I thought the series was on a great uptick, and uh, you know, so I was just checking my options out, and um, I reached out to a, a couple IndyCar teams. Penske was one of them. Um, they were one of the only ones to reply to me, and uh, I was I flew home to Toronto uh, when the Toronto Indy was on, and the Mossport IMSA race was on, and I sort of spoke to some people at both those events, and. Yeah, it just so happened that Penske were looking for a race engineer um, and a race engineer to replace the engineer that was on Newgarden's car. He was wanting to come off the road. So it was like a really good opportunity where not only was there a, an option for a, me to come in and work with the defending IndyCar champion, um, you know, but to have a bit of a time to get up to speed shadowing because this, this guy was kind of willing to do a handover. So, I mean, you couldn't ask for a better setup coming into IndyCar. Oh, for sure. um, so it was a pretty easy decision, really. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, how was it working with with Joseph? Because you guys, uh, I believe, you won the championship together in 2019. If I'm that's right. Mistaken. Yeah. So I, I joined for the 2018 season, and I, I kind of shadowed as a. I, I ran the car at some tests and kind of was shadowing, getting up to speed as a performance engineer, if you will, or kind of back up on that on that car, and then took over running it in 2019. Um, yeah, we won won our first race mm-hmm. together, won the championship. So I mean, you couldn't ask for much more as a, as a first year, <laughs> first sure. year running a car in IndyCar and a uh, bit of a fairy tale season. Um, love working with Joseph. Super, super uh, good good guy. We had a, we we got on really well, um, and we had a good little run there for a few years. We, you know, if everyone's got their ifs and buts, but yeah, it's amazing how close New Garden's been to winning five championships in a oh, row man at least <laughs> yeah for sure i mean holy cow ever since he came over uh from ecr to to penske like he's he's always been in contention for most of the seasons i mean he's an yeah. impressive driver i i think like like his story his story as well is is quite interesting um but yeah i mean going from penske then over to Arrow mclaren I mean, you're now <laughs> you're running the show over there, man. So how did that go down? <laughs> yeah, so you know, I said I was at Penske for about four years, and um, you know, uh, we had a great run, we got some great results. Um, I was looking for someone a bit of a new challenge, a little bit, and um, opportunity sort of presented itself here uh with Aaron mclaren and it just was i mean i'd been seeing what from looking looking from the outside in pretty excited by what was being built over here and then um you know this opportunity to kind of also use a little bit of my f1 background i saw Mm -hmm. this is like a good chance to do the help with that crossover between the f1 side of mclaren racing and in the indycar world of Aaron mclaren um so just so happened there was kind of an opening they were looking that suited me so kind of we made that move got started last july um and then at the end of the season uh with taylor's departure kind of stepped in this racing director role and taking on a, a bigger position in the team but you know right away from showing up here i was like just super pumped about how fun and uh uh what a great kind of culture there there already was at this team with a really great team atmosphere, mechanics. And, you know, one thing you get in racing teams is that a lot of times there's a little bit that can be divides between yeah. the mechanics, between the engineers, between the commercial. And I could kind of feel like people are kind of playing the blame game yeah. or whatever. But this place is the best I've ever worked at for that. And that, that was that was there before I got here. So it was it was refreshing to 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 walk into that and um you know but just the the potential and the opportunity to kind of be a part of building something special was really really what drew me to it i mean last season you guys had what just over 60 employees and then now this season i mean you guys got to be getting close to has to be close to 100 yeah yeah so that's been uh, that's been the story of our off season. A lot of growth. Mm. I mean, adding an extra car, going from a two two car to three car full time operation with a fourth car at Indy. Uh, Alexander Rossi joining the team, which is a great addition. Um, and yeah, we we started last year. I think it was this time last year. I think we were around fifty people or so, um, mm-hmm. and now we're 
over we're in the 90s we'll probably get up to about 100 here once we Ooh. fully level out but uh a massive amount of growth and it, that's what it takes really i mean that's the yeah. sort of scale of team i think you need to uh to try and fight fight at the top end of the series how many resumes a day do you look at or do you even look <laughs> at resumes yeah i mean honestly it's it's one of those things like going into our first rate race in st petersburg and even like the, the open and set opening and testing is like trying to manage a little bit expectations because you know some of these teams that are already there they spent their off season we spent our off season with you know with my best guys spending a decent chunk of their time hiring you know mm -hmm. looking at resumes and choosing the right people and they did a phenomenal job and i think the people we've got are like badass but um you know the other other teams that are already grown can spend that off season they got their heads down trying to make better race cars so mm -hmm. you know we got we got up to speed and, and in january i felt like we were able to kind of change gears firmly towards all right let's let's put this <clears throat> machine to use and try and try and build better race cars and work on our processes and um so pretty pretty excited we were able to get to that first race and, and also really make a stab from performance as well as just grow the team do you, do you have to like shuffle like if you had to like shuffle people from from cars like if if pato has a certain crew certain crew members on his car have you had to like shuffle them around to, to kind of spread it all out across three cars and then obviously with a fourth car coming for the indy 500 for for tony yeah you know i think it, that was an interesting challenge it's a great question because mm. like you take i try to take realistically if you want to put together a well-oiled machine of a team it takes time for those people to learn to work together and, and the research on this stuff is like two to three years um really for a team to, to properly gel and we, we want to do we're trying to do that in weeks <laughs> but uh you know so then it becomes a trade-off do you break up the teams that, that are you know that have the continuity um to sort of spread the experience level or do you take you know more of the the change on on the one car that's already our new driver or what have you and we did a bit of a mix um but we tried to keep a fair amount of continuity on on both uh pato and felix's cars but at the same time you know we made some pretty kind of strategic moves craig hampson most experienced one of the most experienced race engineers on in pit lane you know mm -hmm. we put, we've got him working with Ale alexander rossi this year um the car chief uh, on that crew is todd phillips he's one of the most experienced car chiefs in the pit lane he came to us from uh dale coin in the off season but has worked with craig in the past and for many years is ex they're both, they worked at newman haas together many many moons ago mm -hmm. um you know brian barnhart on the radio uh for rossi's car yeah he's new to us but he's super experienced in the sport so we kind of mixed it up a little bit a bit of experience and then and a bit of you know era mclaren kind of heritage people and, and then new people but uh definitely a tricky one didn't want to completely smash the whole thing up though and rebuild it you know you got a lot of talent there brother uh <laughs> got some uh twitter questions for you I, there's two of them and then uh we got a one from instagram as well uh <laughs> at qt cat uh, has asked is the uh, increased working relationship with the wider mclaren team going so how is that all going for you yeah i felt like that that program was really starting to hit its stride last year i yeah. think um when this um partnership and sort of uh indycar involvement of, of mclaren first kicked off it really it went straight into the pandemic and i think trying to run you know this that put the kibosh on a lot of like cross atlantic travel and i think that sort of stunted the original kind of collaboration that was going on there technically mm -hmm. and uh but last year i really felt like you know momentum was starting to build and you know for me it feels it feels like a good fit because it's funny you can't underestimate how much of a culture difference there is in going racing in IndyCar to Formula One. Like, yeah. in some way, it, it's I'd already lived it because I'd made that jump, 
<laughs> and uh, I kind of lived, oh yeah, this is this is a lot different. And I also kind of approached it with an open mind. Like, I think a lot of people might come from F1 and think I'm going to F1ify IndyCar, and it just doesn't work. You know, <laughs> it's just it's not the way. But at the same time, there's some very high level engineering being done oh, yeah. over um, over there and we can definitely benefit from it but it's it almost like needs a translator in between and I feel like I can play that role a little bit <laughs> from uh, at uh, Mish310 uh, she's wondering uh, how is the more serious buttoned up Alex Rossi fitting in with uh, Pato and Felix so I guess like Pato obviously being and Felix obviously being a little more um, jokesterish as she writes, but yeah, how is Alex, you know, fitting in with everything? Because you know, making that switch from you know Andretti coming over to you guys, it's this gonna be a big move for him. Yeah, you know what? It, I it's one of those things. I think some drivers, what you see, what you're used to kind of seeing in your post race interviews or whatever, can shade your opinion of a character, and then you actually get to know them, and it's like. Maybe not quite the same, you know. <laughs> uh, for me, that like willpower was very much like that. What I thought willpower was going to be, and what I learned willpower was, was two different things. But uh, and um, you know, Rossi, he brings a great level of professionalism to the team. He's he's a he's a pro, and that's that's a great compliment uh, in our world, and it's it's a nice kind of addition. What I would say is that. He's actually got a really raw, like really dry sense of humor and like uh, super sarcastic and is pretty hilarious. So, but in terms of how he's fit in, I couldn't be happier. Honestly, it's early days and we'll see how it evolves. But right now, I I think all three drivers are are collaborating really well. Um, it's the best I've seen here in terms of the ability for us to find common ground and drive kind of development direction um, from the drivers. And, you know, a really open, kind of reaching across the table attitude from everyone. And I would say that in addition to that, kind of like Rossi, uh, you know, what he's brought to the table, also just seeing Pato and Felix, you know, maturing and stepping up and, and growing into their roles. And that's that's fun to see. Um, I don't know if anybody watched St. Pete, uh, you know, Pato really executed a brilliant weekend, took a lot of discipline, uh, and he managed the disappointment of a a late race, uh, you know, hiccup um, very well. So I think that was a lot of positives there. Yeah, you guys did really well. Would you have like three, what, two drivers in the top five? And then obviously we haven't gotten to, to Texas just yet, but I mean, Team looks, team looks pretty awesome, man. Like, because it was kind of rough for Pato at the start of St. Pete, if I if I remember correctly, in uh, free practice one. But yeah, you guys rebounded nicely, man. Um, last one for you. This is from uh, Phil. I don't think you're gonna be able to answer this one, man, because I don't think anybody can. Uh, <laughs> how, <laughs> how long until more manufacturers get back into uh, IndyCar? I, I don't. I don't see it happening happening anytime soon, but yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think everybody in the series would love to see uh, more manufacturer yeah piling in. What, sure. what I what what you can say is that you know crowds at St. Pete were awesome. Yeah, we from a from an attendance point of view, from a interaction on social media kind of numbers point of view, from our our guests and sponsors and partners, uh, interaction and uh, participation, everything's kind of off the charts. So if the sport can keep that kind of momentum, and I think with lots of good, lots of good things in the pipeline, the hundred days program, um, the more we can build, uh, and you know, just a grow, a swelling uh, interest in motorsport in general, um, open wheel racing in North America. That that's obviously. That, in the end of the day, that's what's going to make the difference between, for, for when it comes to a manufacturer deciding to pile into the sport. So kind of got to focus on that and the rest will take care of itself, I think. Yeah, no, definitely. And also take a look at a new chassis because 
kind of need it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my opinion, anyways. <laughs> uh, Gavin, thanks very much for doing this. Uh, really appreciate it. That's racing director for Arrow McLaren, Gavin Ward. Uh, thanks again, dude. This has been great. Yeah, likewise.